Hello everyone, today I'm going to be talking to you about vocal pedagogue John Battista Mancini. He was the singing master at the Imperial Court of Vienna and he wrote Practical Reflections on the Figurative Art of Singing. Mancini was born on January 1st, 1714 in Ascoli, Piceno, Italy, and he died on January 4th, 1800 in Vienna, Austria. He was an Italian soprano castrato, voice teacher, and author of books on singing. He studied singing in Naples with Leonardo Leo and in Bologna with Antonio Bernacchi. He also studied composition and counterpoint there with Giovanni Battista Martini, and together they arranged a performance in 1778 of Gluck's opera Alceste. He began his singing career when he was 16 years old, appearing in both Italy and Germany. He was highly successful as a singer, but his even greater success as a teacher led to an invitation in 1757 from Empress Maria Theresia of Austria to teach her daughters how to sing. In 1774, while still living in Vienna, is when he published his important book on singing, Pensieri e Riflessioni Pratiche Sopra il Canto Figurato, which translates to Thoughts and Practical Reflections on the Figurative Art of Singing. This is the treatise which contains his methodology, which I will be discussing with you today. This is just a side note, but his views and publications brought him into conflict with another voice teacher named Vincenzo Manfredini, who wrote Harmonic Rules or Reasonable Precepts for Learning Music, and they had an ongoing opposition and disagreement when it came to the proper method of teaching singing. Mancini remained in Vienna until he died as the retired singing master, and he left behind a considerable fortune. Mancini had a breadth of knowledge and a lot went into his methodology, and one thing seems to build upon the next throughout his teaching. I want to first read you this quote from his first chapter of his treatise because I believe this sets the scene by truly reflecting how he felt about music and the lens and the foundation through which he taught. It says, Among all the remedies which humanity has invented to fortify itself against indolence and idleness, and among all the objects that hold our imagination and sentiments, there is no doubt but that music is the most jocund and perfect. It is capable of making us forget the pains of life, thus relieving us. It makes us conscious of delicate feelings, and it provokes in us more exquisite sentiments, disclosing to us a better existence by giving us pleasure and recreation. It is commonly believed that music takes its derivation from musa, defined as art of combining sounds in a way pleasing to the ear. Music is considered the most charming and beautiful of all of the liberal arts, and if you investigate the principles of its combinations, the cause and effects which it awakens in us, you will readily see that it can be called a science as well as an art. As singers and vocal pedagogues ourselves, I believe we can certainly objectively agree with this statement. And he goes on in his first chapter to remind us that music is the most ancient of all of the arts and incredibly natural, that wherever there is song, there is also speech. And what I love about his methodology after reading through it is that it seems to come from a very holistic, natural, individualistic approach that requires hard work and self-awareness. Chapter one, the excellence and sterling worth of music sets the foundation for his why and the history behind what he's teaching. He talks a lot about how people from all different professions and walks of life would study music just because it brought them joy, which I think we still see a lot of today as well. And he goes into the history of singing, including the Gregorian chant and what music was like in ancient Greece and Rome and so on, mostly just setting the scene as to why music is so important and why this treatise itself has significance. In chapter two, he talks about the diverse schools and famous men and distinguished women who have flourished in the past century and are still flourishing today. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm impressed that he has a certain respect for women. He speaks so highly of women and mentions just as many, if not more, well-known female singers as male singers. Um, there's a certain equality at this time that's beautiful and it has nothing to do with gender, but everything to do with talent and hard work. One of the things that he says that sets the tone for this chapter and that I love and agree with is that there are many systems and methods that can be used and that are used in the art of singing. Um, he was passionate about teachers knowing how to train each individual voice and that there's a specific remedy for each voice. Each student should have a different style, one which corresponds to each one's disposition and natural gifts. 
Um, a quote from this chapter is, the success of a singer depends mostly upon the science of his teacher and his method of directing him, and also upon his ability to understand the nature of his pupil, which I think is true. Being able to give tailor-made teaching to each student based on their personal sound and understanding what they need not to create a manufactured sound should be the goal of every teacher. He also warns students not to imitate too much, um, but instead focus on improving their natural gifts so they don't lose those. It's also valuable for the singer to have a knowledge of one's own ability and strength and to be able to make an examination of the natural disposition which each of us possess in order that one can be successful in his study and in a corresponding way of living. Mancini also goes on to talk about many famous teachers and singers who influenced him and why, and this chapter also mentions singers who have learned the Italian way of singing and have preserved their voices into old age and even into their 80s, which to me is very impressive, and it just goes to show how effective the Italian way of teaching and singing is. There was also a mention of daily lessons, which is incredible to think about because even in a concentrated collegiate setting um, in our time today, a weekly lesson is considered substantial. Mancini came to the conclusion that even if someone is not a naturally gifted singer, if they have a good teacher and they're a conscientious student who closely applies what he has taught, that the voice can be changed into not only one of mediocrity, but into a thoroughly good voice. I want to leave you with his final statement from this chapter that seems to summarize everything and will hopefully inspire and challenge us as vocal pedagogues, and it's this. If a student left to himself acquires a harmful habit in his method of singing, how can he realize that the habit is a wrong one, and how is he to know whether or not such a habit originates from the natural defects or those acquired unless pointed out to him? How much more evident is the necessity that the teacher can be thoroughly proficient in his art and that he be watchful and observant and eradicate those defects? He must be perfectly skilled and experienced in order to create new artists and so to transmit to the next generation the secrets of that art which has been his glory and renown. Chapter 3 speaks on the moral obligation of parents towards their children and the necessary precautions to be taken before dedicating them to the art of singing. In this chapter, he brings up the point of the potential student's parents needing to seriously consider whether or not their child is a good fit for this career, which I think is important even today. Just because a child can sing a little song in a graceful manner does not mean that they can sing professionally. Getting a professional's opinion is important. Getting real with ourselves and our students before investing so much time and energy into something when failure and unhappiness could have actually been avoided, I think is a wise thing to do. Mancini says it should be absolutely unquestionable that the student has all of the necessary qualifications to succeed. The top two most important being that the student must have a naturally good voice backed by natural musical intelligence. He also goes into the physicality of a prospective student and how the mouth, nose, teeth, larynx, glottis, thyroid gland, tongue, lungs, etc. They all have a role to play in the art of singing. And they all have an effect on the voice. And he says, one must have a harmonious proportion of all of the vocal organs. And if any of these organs are imperfect by nature or disease, the voice will most likely also be imperfect. If then all of these qualifications are met, the student should not be allowed to begin training at too young of an age because the vocal organs are inconsistent until puberty. Chapter 4 talks about concerning the voice in general and the chest register and the head register or the falsetto. In this chapter, he states that the voice only has two registers, the chest voice and the head voice or the falsetto, um, which is interesting to me. It's very basic, but it also makes sense um, because today we talk about having our chest voice, our mid voice, our mixed voice, our head voice, falsetto, and then even whistle tones. So it just shows how he wants to focus on the basics and the foundations right now. He talks about the great art of a singer is the ability to move from one register to another without it being perceptible to the human ear. This is a huge theme throughout his treatise and definitely a foundational point of great singing. And I think we all have those rough parts in our passaggio that we're constantly working on as singers. He admits that it's not easy and it takes study and hard work to correct this defect as he calls it. Um, While working on this, he advises to follow the natural instinct, but never force nature. In chapter five, he talks about intonation. 
Um, not everyone who has a good voice can become a good singer. Even if your voice is pretty, if you have poor intonation, it just doesn't matter. However, the reason for the poor intonation or the dissonance has to be examined. Um, If it can be corrected and it's because of the voice itself, that's one thing. But if the ears and hearing incorrectly um, is the reason behind it, that's quite another. And it probably cannot be overcome, disguised, or remedied. Because even those with an untrained ear are going to notice if you're out of tune. Mancini says the best way to test this, and this is a direct quote from the book, um, he says the student should be tried at singing early in the morning, before eating, during the day, when the sky is cloudy, and also when it's serene, when the wind is placid and tranquil, on a windy and stormy day, and also soon after a full meal. The teacher must go very slowly and observe every detail in order to discern the cause. If every time the student sings at a pitch without noticing it and every possible correction does not work, then this is obviously from nature and the student should be discharged at once because they will never be successful at a singing career. Things that can be accidental and fixed are weakness of the chest, which are caused sometimes by disease or temporary illness, indigestion, lack of concentration, attacking a tone without the help of the piano before feeling perfectly sure of the pitch, and so on. If the student is pitchy one day but sings in tune the next, then there is hope for them and their teacher should be able to help. Until a student is sure of the intonation of a piece, he or she must not be allowed to sing alone, um, meaning without their teacher or an instrument playing their part. He tells teachers to instruct their students well from the beginning in the fundamental parts of the art and then after teach him the many kinds of embellishments. Otherwise, he'll become a singer who can perform only what his teacher has taught him. Then, after all of this is in place, he mentions the importance of teaching the student intervals and using solfeggio to do so and giving a lot of attention to this practice. He says it's proven that the human voice can actually naturally sing at least two octaves and in time teachers should enlarge that range, which is why today there is a tendency to judge a singer's merits by the range of their voice. In his opinion, though, the worth of a voice will always depend upon its evenness of quality throughout the whole register and also perfect intonation. The strength of the medium and chest tones have to be equivalent to the head tones in order to form an even register. It's also important for the students to be able to use the keyboard themselves to check their own intonation. So knowing theory and what accidentals are, such as sharps and flats and naturals and all these things, and being able to sing them are also crucial to the intonation and the musicianship of a singer. Chapter 6 talks about concerning the position of the mouth or the way to open it. When it comes to opening the mouth to sing and the correct way to do so, Mancini says it's one of the most foundational things a teacher fixes, but it's also one of the hardest to correct, and each singer is going to be different. There's not a universal way to correct this. Depending on the size of their mouth, their teeth, the organs of the voice, etc., the teacher must diligently observe what creates the clearest, purest, and fullest sound. Being too open or too closed is not good. A mouth too open will cause the voice to be throaty and be too strained, and it won't have the flexibility necessary to create a clear sound. When one doesn't open their mouth enough, the quality of the voice is dead, nasal, or not enunciated clearly because the tongue is not in the natural position and the sound strikes against the palate and is thrown to the back of the throat. He goes on to say if if these defects grow uncorrected, they can be incurable, Um, which... I don't completely understand why. Maybe it's because of the ossification. I'm not sure. Um, Teachers must give precise rules and directions to a student concerning this. One can't generalize or it won't be of help to the student at all. He says that demonstrating the right and the wrong ways are both great tools. And so the student can see what they're doing that's good. um, And they can also see and hear what they're doing that's Uh, not good and how it's supposed to be. So practical demonstrations. The goal is to have the vocal organs remain relaxed and flexible. And his only fixed general rule is that every singer must shape their mouth for singing just as one would shape it when they smile, meaning that the upper teeth show a little bit and are slightly separated from the lower ones. And he said a good practice to do is having the students pronounce the five Italian vowels And when they are pure, pay attention to the mouth shape because it shouldn't change much, if at all, um, just the tongue and the lips ever so slightly. Chapter 7 talks about the proper way to draw out the voice, to modulate, and place it. In this chapter, he gives the example of three different kinds of voices that are most common and the remedy for each. 
The first is a robust, raw voice that's harsh and shrill. The second is a limited and weak voice. And the third, though rich and of wide range, is yet weak and thin in every proportion. Uh, The first voice needs to be purified and made sweet, and the remedy lies in compelling the student to hold the voice back in proportion to their age and strength, and at the same time produce smooth effects as much as is to be expected from vocal music. Constant attention is required in order to draw the voice out without a trace of shriekiness, especially in the higher tones, and later to obtain quality and evenness in the entire register. It will be hopeless to attempt to obtain good results with any other than these rules um, because it's only by exercising self-possession and concentration and unfolding and expanding the voice very slowly that one can succeed in eliminating its roughness and crudity. Um, So when the student through this effort arrives at a happy and sure execution, they can hope to enter the field of more difficult achievement. The second type of voice, which is limited in range and rather weak, um, although usually being considered very faulty, can be corrected by devoting sufficient study to it. This voice is certainly at a disadvantage because it can be used only in small places, Um, and this in itself is a drawback because as singers, we're often asked to sing in spaces of all different sizes, large and small. Uh, However, in spite of this disadvantage, this voice type um, should not be abandoned. Experience has taught us that with proper study, we can supply those elements which will render such a voice round and strong. The majority of teachers think that they can correct this fault by instructing the student in his daily lessons to sing with full strength of voice, um, hoping that the student will gain in volume and strength and invigorate the weak register. However, this rule is actually dangerous and more than likely won't work because a student of 12, 13, 14 years old can't possibly have sufficient strength of their chest to support such an unnatural effort. Mancini says that this method is more successful when applied in cases where students have already acquired full development and strength of their chest, but who also um, have been illy directed in their first years of training. In fact, it is very different with young singers because it's dangerous to use violent means because of how young they are. And so what he suggests will help with these students um, who are young and they have weak and limited voices are that they should exercise with the solfeggio with sustained notes in their daily study. The result will be further assured if such solfeggio is kept within the limit which the voice permits at that time. And then they should do... um, They should also increase the volume of their voices each day little by little um, with their teacher directing them. And they should do this continuously until they become vigorous and sonorous. When this first step has been accomplished, high notes should be added to the solfeggio exercises. This study can never produce good results unless the voice is equalized and blended in the whole range and since high notes are in a different register, they need to be blended. And um, I'll cover how Mancini says to do that soon. So if this exercise is well-directed and steadfastly and faithfully used in the first years, the students will gain in strength of chest and their advancing maturity will enable them to better comprehend the suggestions of their teachers. And they can practically be assured of success in gaining that quality of voice, um, which appeared first almost impossible. The third kind of voices um, that are thin and weak in the entire register, um, he says usually that he finds this type of voice very weak in the chest tones and without low tones, but they actually usually do have pretty rich high tones or head tones. So if one can successfully enlarge and strengthen the chest register of such a weak and thin voice, they will become good, pleasing, and acceptable. He says the only way to achieve this is to have the student sing in the chest tones only for a certain period of time. Practicing has to be accomplished with a solfeggio, quiet, and even, and in order to further acquire sonority and extension, add to it deep, low tones. Also, it's necessary that the student produces these low tones sonorously, purely, and purged of every defect, and also to vocalize them with a very round pronunciation and in a manner of repose, majestic, and dignified, because uh, the point in all this is to eliminate the immature pronunciation that is generally characteristic of such thin voices. 
Once this great difficulty is overcome, the next step for the teacher is to dictate a solfeggio mingled with the tones of the second register or the head register. And as we find in these cases that such tones are usually already good and that the student possesses the facility to draw them out, the matter of blending the registers should be easily accomplished at this point. In summation, um, sometimes singing teachers think it's best to just sing as loudly and as possible um, and with the full voice to add volume and strength. However, when a student is not steady and well-placed vocally, the common rule of teaching the student to sing in full voice cannot be applied yet. In this case, it would be harmful and undesirable, and instead, it is important to sing with moderation and with great care, looking to master intonation first and singing scales and intervals. Exercise the voice with sustained notes or whole notes, rendered with repose and taken one by one. The teaching must follow the age and strength of the student and not be rushed, but go slowly, little by little, and with the right degree. Steadfast, well-executed practice is the only way to make these rules effective. Forcing the voice is absolutely abuse, and he warns against over-singing in crowded areas because the singers can't hear themselves, and it will mar the beauty of the voice and exhaust the chest or breathing muscles. Extend and unfold the voice. Don't ever force it because forcing the voice is one of the greatest errors a singer can commit. Chapter 8 talks about the blending of the registers, the portamento, and the appoggiatura. After the teacher has used the methods spoken of before to fix the weak and unreliable voice, he ought to start his student in the portamento di voce, or the gliding of the voice, which refers to passing and blending of the voice from one tone to another with perfect proportion and union when ascending as well as descending. This is one of the most important parts of the vocal art, and it should be taught very well and very thoroughly, but the portamento cannot be acquired unless the student has first blended the registers of the voice, which are separated in everyone, but it's more noticeable in some singers than others. Teachers have to be careful not to ruin the student's voice by making sure they're singing in the correct key. For example, a soprano should not be singing in a contralto key, and a tenor shouldn't be singing in a bass key, etc., A great quote from this chapter is that art consists in one's ability to know what nature intended one to be. When once the gifts of nature are known, cultivating them easily makes man perfect. The best and most practical way to help the student acquire the gift of portamento di voce is to make them vocalize with solfeggio, which I believe to Mancini meant the same thing as scales. Um, He wants them to do this on the vowels a and e. There should only be two notes written in a measure and the voice moving slowly between the notes without taking a breath so that the voice has time to expand. And if this isn't too hard, then the student can sing three notes, but no more than that so he doesn't weaken his chest. The student should press the first note a little and through another precept, he ought to pass without taking a breath to the second note with the same control and with modulation. Mancini says that this will be painful and fatiguing in the beginning, but this will enable the student to sing with ease and delight in any style of music and help fasten the voice. In closing, the appoggiatura, trillo, and mordente are nothing but embellishments of the melody, but they are so necessary and music would be boring and monotonous without them. But they only need to be used when expression requires. If not, it takes away the meaning. Chapter 9 talks about mesa di voce. Mesa di voce is a singing technique that requires sustaining a single pitch while gradually making the voice louder and then softer. It is considered to be a particularly advanced test of singing ability. Um, And it's ordinarily used at the beginning of an aria cantabile or on a crowned note and is also used to prepare for a cadenza. However, Mancini says that a real true artist uses it on any sustained or crowned note which he finds in any composition. Um, That the Mesa di voce enriches the singing because it makes it more agreeable to the ear. If this is perfectly executed by uniting the trill to it, he says it makes the cadenza and the singer perfect. (laughs) When a singer is capable of sustaining and crescendoing the agility of their voice without effort or defects, he not only knows the secret of the art but possesses the art itself. The student must not presume to be able to execute the mesa di voce before he has acquired the art to hold, reinforce, and take the breath back because it's dependent on that whether or not he's able to start and to graduate the voice proportionately in value and to retire it without any apparent effort. One cannot push their breath violently, but they need to start it very quietly. 
They must economize the breath by producing it in small degrees so that in this way, um, they will be able to graduate the first tone with more security by taking it in low voice and increasing it to full strength of loudness. And from there, start to retire it with the same degree in which um, they developed it. And that way, we'll find it easy to sustain the tone from the beginning to the end and not be exhausted at the end. Also, with too much breath, the voice will go sharp at the beginning of the tone and it will flatten at the end of the tone. Another piece of advice he gives is to start with the mouth slightly open to produce a sweeter and softer quality and then reinforce the tone by opening the mouth wider. Mesa di voce should be practiced daily, but with many intervals of rest in between the practice. Chapter 10 covers the trillo and the mordente. The trill is an ornament in the art of singing and the most important embellishment in Mancini's opinion. He says the trill is neglected in his day because other voice teachers believe that the trill is either natural to a singer or it's not and that it cannot be taught. But Mancini actually believes that it can be taught. Um, The precepts of art teach us that the trill is formed by a real tone with the help of a false one in the major. Um, The trill must always start on the false tone and end on the real tone, and the false tone must be one tone higher than the real one, and one must think it's still higher, and both must be equally vibrated. If you're in the minor key, the student will see that it falls upon the keys of the gravis ambalo, which is an early form of piano, um, two notes distant and only of one half tone. The mordente originates from the trill, but they're different because the trill is composed of a true and real tone, which is vibrated equally with another note, a tone higher, a feigned tone. The mordente is composed of a real tone hitting a false one, a half tone lower. This half tone must be hammered more slowly and with less force and value than the other tone. However, the trill and the mordente always end the same way, which is on the real tone. The mordente should also be shorter and faster than the trill, and if a singer has mastered the trill, they should also be able to do the mordente. The falces, or the opening of the back of the mouth into the throat, must be free and relaxed, Um, and a singer must use a trill wisely and with good cause, otherwise it's going to become tiresome. Strength lies in perfect balance of knowledge and in the singer using those embellishments of the art to their advantage, which is substantially the beauty of the art and the formation of a virtuoso style which distinguishes the master from the mediocrity. Chapter 11 covers cadenzas and it says when a student has succeeded in fixing and sustaining his voice he may start on a cadenza but it should be a short one in relation to his age and strength and then increase the number of notes and its difficulty to the same degree he develops strength. Continue in this way until the cadenza reaches absolute perfection. A cadenza is a necessity at the end of any well-written song. Even if the song is a masterpiece, it will be languishing and unfinished without one. Chapter 12 talks about the agility of the voice. The agility of the voice is a singular gift from nature and it cannot be acquired, but... It is also a wrong belief that singers cannot be successful unless they sing with agility. Someone with a heavy and raw voice can't change it to study it and make it agile. But this also goes back to self-awareness and knowing and understanding our own strengths and weaknesses and what makes each of our voices special. Agility cannot be perfect unless it is natural, and when it is not perfect, it leaves an audience indifferent. If one does not possess agility, they should not waste time in trying to acquire it. If a student does possess this gift, the training in it should not begin until the registers of the voice have been perfectly blended. Carelessness at this point would cause much harm to the voice because the agility would be uneven where the registers change and thus be defective in strength and clarity and also out of proportion. Agility requires major breath control. A couple of the different runs he mentions are these. First is the volatina run, which must produce the breath to expand the voice when sustaining the first note, which prepares the run and not use the voice with violence. The tone must be held even and the breath kept light while performing the run. Using mesa di voce works well with this run. We also have the single or the redoubled run that is used and mingled with other passages in straight movement. However, in this, the singer must pay strict attention that it is always performed distinctly, clearly, and well graduated. This run must never be interrupted but carried through to the final tone in one breath. 
Although the rules in this part of the art are very plain and ratified by the most experienced singing masters, some, due to their not knowing how to support the first tone with the strength of the chest and knowing still less about the art of graduating the breath, take the first note with unusual violence, and as they are incapable of sustaining and controlling it, they think that by closing the fauces or the lower part of the throat, that they succeed in controlling the breath and the voice. The voice placed in such a forced position can appear only heavy because it's choked and it's closed in the throat and smothered in the palate. Thus, a clear run is changed into a bad slur of voice which disgusts the hearers and evokes pity instead of delight. In conclusion, a run and all kinds of agility must be supported by a robust chest assisted by the graduation of the breath and a light fauces in order that each note be distinct, although executed with the greatest velocity. Another style performed by agile singers is the martellato, which means hammered, Um, and this consists of repeating a tone many times. Typically, one note is a little higher than the other three, and this requires an extraordinarily agile voice and great perseverance to master it. One must also have perfect breath control to master it, and the intonation must also be perfect so that every hammered note will be distinct and perfectly pitched. When learning this technique, the student must sing it slowly at first, making sure each note is attacked at the right pitch and to make sure the chest does not get tired. The teacher will know when the student is ready to take it at the required speed. Another embellishment is called the cantar di sbalzo, meaning by leaps. A student who is fit for this kind of agility would have a robust chest and an agile voice having low, deep tones as well as high ones. And if not, they must not attempt this. The best way to learn how to sing this way is with whole notes. The first note must be perfectly pitched before leaping over a number of tones without taking a breath. And do not force the high tone or that will tire the chest. After singing with whole notes, the student may attempt the same notes quicker. It also must be sung with appoggiatura vibrata or the leap loses all of its natural beauty and value. A problem that can happen when singing leaps is sometimes singers will keep their lips abnormally closed on the low notes and open their mouths much too wide on the high notes, and then this results in a completely different character and color, which is what we absolutely don't want, because the voice, again, needs to blend and be balanced throughout. I think what Mancini is also saying here is also to not take too much weight up into the higher notes. When a voice is found with natural agility, the teacher must not overlook the other important foundational tools such as portamento, um, the blending, all of these other things. All of the general rules are considered a foundation for every voice, no matter the natural gifting. Chapter 13 covers the knowledge one needs to sing or recite well in the theater. It's not the beauty and agility of the voice alone that distinguishes the artist upon the stage, but it's also excellent acting that gives enjoyment, distinction, and engagement. This means comprehending the value of each word, using the correct diction and accent, and having clear pronunciation. The actor must know grammar, history, and the language he is acting in. It's not always what we say, but it's also how we say it. A beneficial habit to form is to daily read a portion of a book out loud, and poetry is preferable. By doing this, one forms the habit of making all of the necessary changes in shades of their voice and learns to recite well in public. One should also study history, both sacred and secular, and also classic novels. Reading all of this helps the singer acquire mature judgment. Mancini thinks the best way for a young singer to learn Italian is to actually live in Italy for several years and to immerse themselves in the language and converse with those who speak it correctly. Chapter 14 covers recitative and acting. After Italian and Latin languages and history are mastered, which are necessary for recitation, the student must study acting. To be a great artist, it is not enough to sing well, but one must also master the art of acting. He is very upset by singers thinking that singing well um, is enough and that the acting part or the declamation of the recitative doesn't matter as much. It's important and it should not be looked past. A well-delivered recitative accompanied by correct action is just as impressive as a cantabile. After all, the drama was written purposefully to be set to music, but it can also stand alone by itself. Mancini's thoughts on the way to say and act out a recitative are as follows. For the semplice, meaning simple, um, which is the recitative that's accompanied by only the bass, um... This is so that the dialogue wouldn't languish too much. It was placed between arias, duets, choruses. 
they were composed simply to sound natural. Um, And they're not only situated in the natural chord of each voice, but they are marked and divided in such a way as to perfectly imitate natural speech. And because of this, the singer can distinguish each period and can follow the interrogatives, declarative points, and all the parts of speech. All these shades are expressed and are varied according to the different inflections of the voice, the diversity of tone, and the feelings to be expressed. The other style of recitative is called instrumentato with orchestration um, or with orchestration. So the accompaniment fills in those bars in which the singer has only action and the music follows him to give brilliancy and life to all that he says and does. It's also customary for the voice and orchestra to perform in perfect time in order to not interrupt the feeling and expression. This style of recitative was invented to emphasize some important scene that ends in a deep... um, in a mood of deep feeling, such as agitation, fury, tenderness, pathos, etc. Therefore, it would be very improper to do it in a mesa di voce or a portamento style. It needs to be done plainly and naturally, distinguishing different moods. However, using a well-placed appoggiatura is appropriate in this uh, sense. A random piece of advice in this chapter circling back to acting and bodily awareness is that one must learn to walk gracefully and naturally on and off the stage and that the best place to learn this is at dancing school and fencing and horseback riding are also good. So singers, we can go ahead and add that to our training as well. Chapter 15 covers the order, rules, and general behavior to be observed by an earnest student while learning the art of singing. There's a quote in this chapter that basically sums up the whole chapter and it's this. Don't abandon your study and deem it worthless just because you are already praised for your talent. Do not allow conceit to blind you. Earnestness in study, goodwill, true and sincere love for hardships, and Christianity are the necessary requisites to make a professor distinguished and honored throughout the world. What a great reminder for all of us. In conclusion, Mancini made important contributions to musical culture through this tristis on singing. Um which was then after published in English as well in 1967. Um, This reached an even greater audience and it made even more of an impact even after his death. His book is interesting as an extension of another treatise of the day by Pier uh, Francesco Tozzi, and Mancini essentially just fills in the details of Tozzi's work, emphasizing that singers must train rigorously for a long period of time. Mancini was one of those who supported the so-called cult of agility. In that sense, influential teachers like him played a considerable role in determining later 19th century performance practice, in particularly by striving towards unknown levels of virtuosity and leaving a legacy which we still learn from today. Thank you.